It's is, not on? Is the mic on? Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, there we go. Hey, teammates, how are we doing today? Ooh. All right, we had a lot of strategic conversations, right? And I was like, hey, let's get at it. Let me give you the strategic overview of the Chiefs group. No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go extremely tactical. I'm going to go extremely tactical. We're going to talk about an emotional topic for all of you guys, because when you call the Chiefs group, you have an emotional thing on your mind. You've got some things impacting your family, your dream assignment, whatever, and you're calling me, hoping, me, I, hoping that I don't crush your dreams. I'm going to try not to. We really try to get to yes. Before I, before I do that, though, I do have one of our assignment managers here with me, Master, Master Sergeant Select Vasquez, JV. <laughs> Let, let me tell you something about JV. You guys know we always like to highlight our people and everything like that. JV did a little bit of time in the Chiefs group about a year or so ago, kind of, kind of filled in. And then I had an opportunity to poach him off the A1 staff. We had an opening. And he sat down in the seat and hit the ground running and is probably one of the most knowledgeable assignment managers I have after one month in the seat. And that's why he's down here with me now. You guys will understand when I get through the briefing how we break down assignment managers, how that you're going to engage the Chiefs group and things like that. But JV is here for you. So back in the back of the break room, you've probably already seen him, got a little table set up, got his computer there, got Slickums downloaded. You guys are going to have a couple of questions and things like that throughout the week. CJV was, is back there for you to kind of explain to you kind of what you should think about. Here's what he does not know. He does not know yet the assignments that are coming out in 22 Charlie in March. He does not know that. So let me just get in front of that right now. He doesn't know it, right? But he will remember names, so be nice to him. So again, this really is a pleasure for me to be here. Um, it is an honor to serve uh, in the Chiefs group. When I, when I talk, give this brief, I like to kind of give a little bit of background of myself and, and where I've gone. So I've been a chief for about 10 years. Um, I had an opportunity to go and be the command chief at uh, um, Spangalem. From there, I went, uh, a couple sabers in the room, I hear, right? You know, we went from there. I went to Aviano as a wyvern. Pretty cool. Don't hate me. Don't hate me. I had a couple of tough assignments, right? You know. But uh, from Aviano, I went down to IMSC, was the command chief at IMSC. And, and I was really, there we go, got some IMSC family in the house. Um, do miss them and General Wilcox. But I was ready to retire. I was ready to retire. I was thinking, hey, it's about time, you know, what else is next? Uh, maybe we retire. And uh, SimSaf called me and said, hey, well, what do you think about the Chiefs group? And internal, I always kind of had a secret desire to be at the Chiefs group. I was like, okay, I think we can do that. And a big part of that is because I just like to help people. I just really like to help people. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind as we go through some things because I can't always say yes, but we're going to always try to get you the yes. Right, and so I see this as an opportunity to really get after some things in the Chiefs group that we need to fix, and then an opportunity to explain to all of you who are now new Chiefs, what is this Chiefs group, what does it mean to you, how is it different, and what should you expect when you engage with us? So that's a little bit of my background. Again, and before I get started, I know we got some POL in the house, right? The hell? POL, right? There you go. So now you know where I really came from, but uh, um, we'll get after it and we'll get going. Next slide, please. So this is some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about right here. I'm not going to go over the, uh, the overview slide. Um, next slide. This is my team right here. And I couldn't be prouder of a team of eight than I've ever been in. This was also another desire of mine to go to the Chiefs group, lead a small team, a small team of professionals. But there's one big difference with this team up here, and that's me. The difference is I am the only one up there that does not have a personnel background. That's done deliberately. Again, my background is logistics fuels, and uh, every one of those are hand-picked personnelists. They are the experts at assignments. They advise me. Here's why it's like that. The reason that SimSaf wanted me in there is she wanted an experienced, seasoned chief in the chief's group so that when you call and you're working with your career field manager, when you're working with the assignment manager, and you've got a unique challenge or a unique problem, and we need to do something outside of what the book says, that's where I get involved, right? That's where when the MAGCOM command chief calls me and says, hey, Lud, this doesn't make sense. Let's take another look at that, and let's see what we can do and how we can get to right. So those, that team right there, anchored by Senior Master Sergeant Franklin, she's my deputy, 
they're the ones that advise me. They're the ones that say, hey, hey, Lud, I know you want to do this, but uh, here's the second and third order effects um, if you do that, and here's some other things you need to think about you know, in order to do that. I'm going to give you guys some examples, and we'll talk about things. Another thing up here is the bottom three, Oliver, Holland, and Vasquez, all brand new. So we've got a lot of new talent in the Chiefs group, but again, hand-picked, and I'm very excited about where we're taking the Chiefs group. Next slide, please. Okay, Chiefs, pull your phones out. Take a picture of this slide. This is probably the most important slide I'm going to show you today. Get this one right here. I'll stand in the middle. If you want to get me in it, too, you can get a good shot of me, you know, whatever we got going on here. This is probably the most important slide right here. I think we're going to pass out slides. This is out there on our SharePoint. It is out there in Slickums. You can get these overview slides. Here's the deal. I talked to you about I'm not a personnelist. I don't even have mill PDS access. I keep talking to them about that. I want to get it. I'll be like, I'm the first one that's going to get it. Oh, you got to go to tech school. Let's do it, right? But uh, um, I can't change anything for you in the system. You call me and say, hey, I need to help with my report no later than date, my DROS, whatever. I don't have the system access to do anything, right? I still get a lot of phone calls and emails, but I don't have system access to do anything. Everybody else? Based on what you see there for your assignment functional code, I'll pick on the fuels. I talked about them a little bit earlier. 2F, Master Sergeant Oliver is the 2F assignment manager. So if you are in POL, you're a 2F chief, your first phone call, if you have any kind of question, any kind of concern, is going to be to Master Sergeant Oliver. He's going to be the one that's going to help explain to you what's going on in that career field and where you might stand. He's the one that knows the X's and O's of that career field. I don't have the bandwidth for that. I get a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, and folks think that I am intimately familiar with the assignment we just loaded for you. I didn't even know that you got an assignment, didn't know you were a surplus. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the assignment manager after you email and call me and say, hey, Sergeant Oliver, what's up with this? He's like, I don't know. I haven't talked to him. And he's going to be reaching out, or I'm going to be sending you an email. Please start with your assignment manager. With that, your career field manager. We're going to talk a little bit about priority plans and how priority plans are different for chiefs and how we do chief assignments, you should be talking with your career field manager about things that are going on in your career field. That'll help you kind of understand how you should think about navigating the assignment cycle as a chief. Next slide, please. Again, very important slide. So here's the chief's group roles. So again, personal goals considered, but they're secondary to mission. So here's the deal, team. I would tell you I've been in the seat now about four to five months, and I've been through all kinds of different peaks and valleys as I've kind of gone through learning this job. It's, it's been one of the more challenging jobs for me to learn because I've never done anything like this before. But here's, here's what I've come to realize. 95% of every question, every email, everything that you present to the chief's group and that you're thinking about makes absolute sense to me. It makes sense to me because I can put myself in your foxhole. I've been there. I have to look at assignments, and I have to look at what we're doing from an enterprise approach. So always understand that when my decision and when you're presenting something to me or when I'm having these conversations, I'm thinking of the ripple effect for the career field. I'm looking at career field manning. I'm taking into consideration what's the impact on the family, what's happening in the career field. I'm sensing everything, but I'm ultimately going to make a decision based on an enterprise approach. I need to be able to always, I say this, publicly defend that. I am going to be extremely transparent. If I'm not transparent, guess what? You guys are going to tell each other. Somebody else is going to know. It's going to get out. And the next email I'm going to get is going to say, Lud, but you did it for so-and-so. Yeah, I did, but there was reasons why we did that, and here's the thing. So I'm going to be transparent. So sometimes I, I, I say that, I set it up as, when I'm giving you a response, even though I understand exactly where it's coming from from you guys, my answer still may be a little bit different than what you said. And I like to, I like to have that conversation and some of that dialogue so that then you can help understand my perspective. Be careful what you get on the streets. We were talking about that over here a little bit ago, and it was pretty good. Um, the other chiefs out there think they know the chiefs group, but they probably ain't read the handbook in a while. Right, so talk to your assignment manager. Take an advisement. You want to ask other chiefs what's going on and things like that. But when you really, hey, where do I stand? What's my assignment going to look like? Mission versus kind of personal needs and stuff like that. Um, 
start with the assignment manager and your career field manager. I think you'll, you'll get a little bit better there. Next slide, please. Okay, Chase Group Responsibilities. I am going to walk through these a little bit more than I usually do. Newer crowd, I want you to kind of understand some things, um, what we do. This is just a snapshot of some of them. So we have four assignment cycles per year. I'm going to talk a little bit more specific about those into the brief a little bit so you'll understand in the cycle where you have opportunities to influence and where the Chiefs group kind of operates. The four cycles, though, keep this in the back of your mind. Two primary cycles, your alpha cycle and your Charlie cycle. The two cycles in between that, your Bravo and your Delta cycles, those are called out of cycles. Those out of cycles are just to, find, just to fill positions that during the regular cycle we filled it, somebody didn't get medically cleared, we got to go back. They're smaller cycles, less opportunities, but it prevents us from gapping positions longer when we get, need to get in there and still fill them. So you'll, your two main primary cycles are what we're going through right now in, in Charlie and what we're going to go through in 23 Alpha. Alpha and Charlie are your primary cycles. Um, Delta and Bravo are your kind of out of cycles where they're smaller, it's typically reserved for more of your sit positions, but I'll be honest with you, anything we need to fill, we're going to get in there, we're going we're to get it filled. We don't want to gap anything any longer than we have to. Um, but here's the kicker. This will make sense at the end when I talk about some changes we're doing. The report no later than dates for the out of cycle fills are the same as what they rolled over from from the normal cycle. So I'm going to give you an example. I want you to chew on it. We're going to get back to it. So in the middle of the summer, in 23 Alpha, when I'm filling assignments, a 1 January or a 10 January report no later than date probably makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. It's a good half a year. Get somebody in there, get their family situated, wherever you're going makes a lot of sense. Fast forward to the out of cycle, which assignments flow the week before Thanksgiving, and I hand out assignments the day before Thanksgiving, and I tell you to be somewhere 10 January. It's a problem I've uncovered. We got to fix. We got to get after. We're going to talk about that a little bit. I, we, we've got to have more stability for our chiefs. But the way the current system is designed, it's just basically rolling over and using the same report no later in dates. We got to do a little bit better about that. So that's kind of the, the background on um, assignment cycles. Retirement waiver authority. So this is the first position as a chief that I've ever been in where I actually have some authority. So I work for Lieutenant General Kelly. A1 in the Pentagon, and he actually grants me authorities. I am the decision maker for active duty service commitment waivers, right? So that's the number one kicker that typically gets folks to retirement. And I believe that there's someone in here, you may not be honest with me about it, someone in here is already planning on their retirement now, haven't even sewn it on yet, and you know, I'm going to get to do my two years, and then I'm going to ask Chief Ludd for a 12-month active duty service commitment waiver. I get these things all the time, right? And look, then don't accept the strike. Hey, I appreciate that. But what I'm going to tell you is that active duty service commitment is there to protect your career fields. It's there to protect the organizations. It's making sure we have stability. It's there for your development. I don't look at those things and just blindly approve them. So understand that. I'm talking to your career field managers. It's not automatic. If you think that you can't do this for three years, then let's have that conversation right now. You probably shouldn't be taking the strike from someone. And that's just me having some real talk and just be brutally honest with it, right? There are times, family situations and things that just make sense, where we need to approve these active duty service commitment waivers. I get that, right? But it shouldn't be the norm. And I tell you, over the first four months, people look at this as like it's an automatic. What do you mean? Now you can waive 12 months. Wave it. No, wait a minute. There's a reason this shouldn't be looked at as an automatic. So please think about that. And I would tell you, look internally. If this is something you can't commit to for three years, you shouldn't be doing it. Just, just my point on that. So just understand how I look at active duty service commitments and that. Um, but I also know that there's... There's a story behind every one of them, and, and we're going to hear you out. Command chief, we would run the command chief process. i got another slide for that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll hit on that a little bit. That's one of the big things. That's probably what monopolizes and takes most of my time. I manage the command chief assignments, the command chief assignment books and things like that, and I have a lot of demanding customers in the MAGCOM command chiefs. A couple of them are sitting right up here. Um, right, I have to, have to keep them close to me. Um, nominative positions, these are positions, you know, like your career field manager and things like that. So let me help you understand this. You might want to be the career field manager, 
And no doubt, you're good at what you do. But if a nominative position, you have to be nominated, right? And that doesn't mean that you get to nominate yourself. That means your senior rater, your command chief is where that process starts. It's going to flow up to one of the MAGCOM command chiefs, and they're going to nominate for the command, and they're going to tell me who to put on that slate. You can call me all day long. You can tell me about what you're doing and what the career field needs, and I love you. I love it. I love the energy. Hey, you're not getting on the slate unless you are nominated from your command. So please understand that about nominated positions. If you think you need to be in that conversation, I wouldn't start it with Chief Ludd. I'd start having that conversation with your command chief. And I wouldn't start having that conversation, just from experience, when the nomination flows out. You should have probably already been talking about that command chief when you sat down with them as soon as you made chief and said, you know, I kind of got a desire maybe to be the career field manager one day. Or you get to your next base and you've been doing this a while and you sit down and you have that intro with your, with your command chief. Let them know what your desires are and what you want. They'll help you get there, you know, but just understand that about nominative positions. Uh, Wing Commander uh, course briefings just did that last week, get an opportunity to go out at PCT pre-command training, brief uh, wing and group commanders, and that's a lot of good feedback for me. You know, I provide them a lot of the same information I, I give you guys here, but what I get is good feedback there about how we can help the organizations, and I'm going to talk to you about a few things that we're going to do here in a little bit as well. Course selection, um, I'll tell you, Chiefs, you're, you're going to say, hey, I want development, I want to go to these courses. We have limited inventory. A vast majority of our senior leader development courses and things outside of the norm, CLCs and stuff like that that we send folks to, is really once you start getting into the group and the command chief levels is where you really looked at that. Just we don't have the inventory. We don't send every one of our command chiefs to a senior leader development course. There's just not that many out there. We do have some folks in the Pentagon. Ian Eichen is doing some great work um, up with HAF and SAF too where we're starting to get more and more opportunities. And I've opened the bandwidth up for some of them too. Like, um, take, for example, some of our, if it's AOR specific regional seminar, it's out in AFRICOM, right? I, I don't need to send the command chief from PACAF out there, right? What I need to do is I need to send somebody who's going to be operating in that, in that environment. So that absolutely could be one of you sitting in here because you got a job going forward, going into AFRICOM or something like that. So we are trying to open them up, but just understand this is low, low inventory and low numbers of courses that we're talking about there. But the chief's group does manage that for you. Um, uh, advisor to the AFSELC, so that's one of the things too there. So basically, I, I said earlier I work for Lieutenant General Kelly. He's my boss. He's my supervisor. But the reality is I probably work more for SIMSAF than anyone else. SIMSAF is the one that's kind of giving me my direction, asking me questions. Hey, here's a good one. Hopefully some of you guys got the bio, update your bio and Slickums email that went out the other day. Here's why that happened. It's, it's not just about assignments. SIMSAF sent me an email you know, over the weekend and said, hey, I need the bios on these X number of chiefs. Okay, cool, that's easy. I can go right into Slickums, pull that up. I go in, less than 50% of you guys had bios in there. It wasn't you guys in this room. But these were no kidding chiefs, a couple of command chiefs on that. And I'm like, I can't believe that. So again, help me, the bios are important because you never know who's asking. Again, if I'm looking at senior leader development courses, I'm pulling your bio to look at that kind of, if you don't got a bio in there, I'm probably gonna pass right on by you. Go to the next one, right? So help me with those kind of things. Uh, that's a little bit of AFSELC work. Promotion board uh, panel selection. So when you guys go on promotion boards and you get an opportunity to volunteer for that, don't commit to something that you, that you cannot commit to. I understand COVID's caused some challenges and you got to back out, you're sick and things like that. But if you raise your hand, that's an awesome, a very cool experience. Just understand that until throughout that board, you're an alternate and we're looking at you, we might be trying to replace you. So if you volunteer for something, you're committing to it, but we put those boards together and then send it down to AFPC and then they run and manage the boards. And then every two years we do the chief grade review. Next slide, please. Keeping an eye on my time, I don't wanna to go too much. So goal is to get to, to yes, communicate early. Um, we do policy and execution in the same office. So that's how we're really different. What I need you to focus on here though is go down to um, the, the hand match every assignment. So here's where things start to get different for you now as a chief and why you have a chief's group and how we look at your assignments. First, there's assignment policy that I have to follow. So there's a DOTI and there's law that we, that we have to follow certain things with regret to assignment policy, can't waive everything. But then you have CFM priority plans, career field managers releasing you if you wanna go and do something outside of your functional area. Um, vectors are important. 
and then your volunteer status. So just because you see something out there in Slickums, if you don't meet the requirements that are out there in Slickums, you can volunteer all day long. What the assignment managers do is that's what they screen and that's what they scrub. And that's why I say that conversation is where they can help you know if you should be volunteering for something if they're going to consider you. Because if you're not going to be released, if you want to go and you want to be, uh, you got a first sergeant background and you want to go be a MAGCOM, you know, first sergeant, if your career field is 70% man and they're not releasing anybody, we're not putting you on that slate. I don't care how good of a first sergeant you were or how bad you want it or that it's your dream assignment. Got it. You need to start that conversation with your career field manager. Get your career field manager on board because that's what I'm going to do. When the conflict comes up, I'm going to go to the career field manager. I'm going to talk to the assignment manager, and that's how we're going to figure out, you know, what do, what do we need to do. Sometimes, though, it's a location specific. Sometimes we need to take care of a family. And sometimes the right answer is we need to release this chief so that they can go do one of these jobs because we need to get a family member who may have a disability or something to a certain location. That's then when I can start to have different conversations with career field managers and assignment managers and say, hey, I understand. I understand the health of the career field. But for this chief and this family, this is right now. And we can get them on those slates and do that. So that's kind of, kind of help, help you start broaden where I get involved and where we navigate that a little bit. Um, but just keep in mind, if you're ineligible, you're not going to make those slates. The way you're going to know if you made a slate is you're going to get an email. If you don't get an email, you didn't make a slate. If you volunteered for a SIP job this cycle and you're still wondering if I got a chance, but if you didn't get an automated generated email from Slickums saying that your name has been pushed to X job, you did not make the slate. Right? So that's how you'll know what's going on. And that usually we fill the SIP positions. This is an important nugget to write down. We fill the SIP positions first, then we fill your functional positions. So when you're volunteering for jobs, it's not like, oh, if I volunteer for a short, I'm going to get hit for that first before I get, it's nothing like that. First you do, we fill all the SIP jobs, commander hires. And then after those commanders get the, the choices that they want, then we go down and we outline and we lay out the, the functional jobs. And then those folks that didn't get hired, we know where it starts. So that, again, may change your rack and stack where you come out for some of those jobs. Next slide, please. The assignment cycle. I want to draw your attention to this is the assignment cycle we're going through now. I want to draw your attention to 17 December. Self-initiated actions due. Another very important date. We put these out there in Slickums. This is publicized. Anything you need to get done to influence your assignment has to happen before that date. Not when we send out surplus notices. Oh my gosh, did my email get blown up in one day. Like 240 some emails in one day, right? Because all of a sudden somebody got a surplus notice they didn't know and then they want me to help. But again, okay, I gotta go talk to your assignment manager. That needs to go to assignment managers. But let's just say you've got a, a, a junior in high school, right? It's the end of the year and you wanna do an Assad. You wanna stay where you're at. We, we do approve most all Hassads, very few Hassads. We're trying to get to yes on just about everything. But if you send me an Hassad when I'm in the middle of the assignment cycle, I'm going to say submit it after this assignment cycle is over. You may get an assignment this cycle, because, and then I'll consider it going into the next cycle. What I cannot do is consider a bunch of Hassads the moment that everybody got surplus notices. We can't operate the system that way. We're working over 500 assignments, hand matching them with really seven folks, you know, actually doing the work. That's a lot. And hand working all of them. They're busy at that point. We can't stop and start working all these other things to figure out what our inventory is going to be. So you're not going to get much sympathy from me if you come in after self initiated actions do. Anything before that, work with your assignment managers. They're going to work it, they're going to get it done. But that's very important because of the pace at what happens once we start working the cycle and getting through there. Um, you'll find that uh, you'll, you'll get very good help from the assignment managers when they're, when they're in between the cycles. And that's why it's kind of set up that way. So again, pay attention to that when we, when we put these out there. Um, and again, keep in mind the out of cycles. This is the assignment cycle I was explaining earlier and where we're at. Next slide, please. Okay, moving to chief. So these are some things you need to understand. I usually brush through the first three, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time on them here just so that you understand these terms and what they mean to you. If you got a surplus notice, that does not mean email chief flood. Say that in jest. I think a lot of people thought that that means, oh, I got a surplus notice, email chief flood. No, I love you guys, but don't email me. 
um, just because you got a surplus notice. What that is, that does not mean you're going to necessarily move. It means, hey, you're vulnerable to move. The best way I can explain that is you're vulnerable. In other words, you might be sitting in a master sergeant billet, a senior master sergeant billet. There might be multiple chiefs in the same functional area there. But a lot of variables go into if we move you or not that cycle. A lot of variables, like depending on the health of your career field, you might be overmanned. We might have more chiefs than we've got positions. I might leave you there for a cycle or two. Right? Talking to your career field manager will help you understand that. Right? So career field managers will help you understand probably how vulnerable you are if you get a surplus notice. I'm never going to tell you you are or are not getting an assignment. I'm not going to do it. Right? But what I'm going to tell you is surplus means you're vulnerable. Surplus means when the listings come out, you should be reviewing that and volunteering for jobs you want to go to. Do not volunteer for something you don't want to do. Make me non vol you. If you volunteer, I'm assuming you want it. If you rack and stack all the 2F jobs out there, fuels, fuels chiefs, I, I see you on there and you want to go to wherever, hey, they're volunteering. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at you as a volunteer. Only volunteer for what you want to go to. The rest of them, we're going to fill them and make us non vol you. That's how you kind of need to think through and navigate that. But that's what surplus moves. Must mover, you're going, and you're going in that cycle. And not much, and not much is going to change it. You're on a remote. You know when, what cycles you're going to hit. We're going to load you an assignment. Yeah. Here's what it does not mean. And, 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 I, and this is hard, right? Because you guys talk to each other, and you think something's coming up in the next cycle. Can you just move me to the next cycle? Can you just, no, we, we got to hold to the process. we got to keep the integrity of what we're doing in check. And if you're a must mover in X cycle, the choices are whatever the choices are there. Chiefs will tell you they're going to retire, and they won't. If I start holding you, if I start holding you to say, okay, let me do you a favor, and I'll get you the next cycle, then you go, oh, yeah, but so-and-so didn't retire, and I wanted to go to Moody. Maintainers really love Moody, right? They want to get there, and hey, so all of a sudden it's not open. We're holding you to the cycle. If you're a must mover and you get that notice, plan to move. Volunteer for things. Be talking to the assignment manager. Be talking to your career field manager. That means you are going to get an assignment in that cycle. Code 50s, all those things, you're going. Um, SIP, functional assignments, um, we do those fair and equitable. I'm going to talk a little bit more about group superintendent hiring, and you'll get to kind of understand what we do with uh, SIP jobs a little bit more. But that means the commander gets to pick. Basically, if it's a SIP job, it's a, a group superintendent or something like that, we're going to give a slate of chiefs who meet the qualifications to a hiring authority, and they're going to get to pick which chief that they want. And again, they don't always get their number one. We're going to talk about that in a minute. There's a deconfliction process we have to go through with some things. Um, the, next, the next one's there, retirement actions. I already hit on that with the active duty service commitment waiver. A lot of times if you're retiring, then we're going to project a vacancy. It's going to go through A1, and we're going to go ahead and fill you. Um, know this about retirement. I don't process your retirement. AFPC does. The only time the chief's group will get involved is if you need a waiver or an exception to policy. Then their, the approval authority is here, and then we'll, we'll figure out what we got to do. And, and don't file a congressional on me if we, if we can't support you because you're like 60% man. I say that because it's happened. <laughs> right? But, but again, right, sometimes the answer is going to be no if you have an active duty service commitment and we still need you to serve and take an assignment and all of that. That's why I tell you, if you can't commit to those three years, right, we're, we're thinking we're going to move you, you're going to get an assignment, you're going to go overseas, you're going to do some different things like that. If, if, if that doesn't fit your lifestyle, you, you may want to think about accepting that strike. Um, fresh expertise. So here's the difference between fresh expertise and non-standard movement. Please, please pay attention to this. This is important. This confuses a lot of people. Fresh expertise. Fresh expertise means you've been in a position probably too long. A lot of times, think about a group superintendent. They've been there three years. New commander comes in. You're, you're crushing it. You're doing a great job. You're doing absolutely everything we expect you to do and then some. right? But your commander just says, hey, I love you, but I just want fresh fresh expertise in here. I just want a fresh perspective. So that means, good thing, next cycle, we're going to say, all right, we'll move you if we approve it. We're going to send you on. You get say in where you go. You get to volunteer for assignments. You get to do whatever. You're going to essentially be a must mover, right? And so we're going to move you on in the next cycle. Nothing bad about fresh expertise. Nothing bad at all. Non-standard movement, the complete opposite end of the spectrum. You did something stupid, right? 
or you've been substantiated in an, an IG investigation and we've decided to keep you in our Air Force. I'll tell you, Lud's opinion, some folks need to just go. The hardest thing that I've been told to do is, yeah, we need to find a place for this chief to go, but we can't have him around airmen. Just think about that for a minute. Just think about that for a minute, right? How do I navigate that, right? But, I, but again, the decision was made, we're keeping them, we're going, here's the difference between that and fresh expertise. I'm sending you where I think you need to go based on everything that I'm gonna sense and take in. I gotta have conversations with commanders where we're gonna send you, and you're going quick. In other words, if it's a non-standard movement, you don't get a vote. You're gonna get assignment. Your vote might be retirement. I'll probably approve that active duty service commitment waiver to let you go. <laughs> so, all right. So if you want to, you want to him, you want to get me, do a non-standard movement, do something stupid, and we'll get you out of the Air Force. Um, and that we'll probably talk. Uh, SimSAF at some point will bring up continuation boards, some things that we're looking at, some things that we're implementing, stuff like that. It'll end up falling under the chief's group, but we still got some work to do. But it'll be a way of putting some teeth behind do not retain. Next slide, please. All right, now I'm going to get to a point where we can have some Q&A, too, hopefully. Um, the Chief's Handbook, I'm going to speed up a little bit. The Chief's Handbook, get out there, read it. You guys probably got it sent to you when you made Chief. Everything I'm talking about here today, there's something on that in the Chief's group. Before you call that assignment manager, look up, oh, Hassad, high school deferment, read the paragraph on it. It will probably let you know what you need to do. We've got templates out there and Slickums and all of that. Read the handbook. They explain all of this stuff here, um, what we do. I'm not going to belabor in all of this. We've talked about them. Know this about 365 deployments. Um, if you want to go back to the base you were at, we won't backfill you. If you want to move on and go somewhere else, the next cycle, we're going to backfill that, that assignment there with 365s. And know that for the most part, they're not, they're not PCSs, so you don't get the same entitlements. They're deployments. We're still going to move you after the fact and things like that on your next assignment. But when you're gone and when you go, some of the entitlements for your families are different because it is a deployment, not a PCS. Something to, to keep in mind when you're volunteering for those 365s. Next slide, please. All right, uh, group positions. Uh, this is what I want to talk to you guys about. Um, a couple of things that I want you to think about. Uh, my preference, my preference is, doesn't always mean we're going to do it this way, you need to go do a functional job before we start talking about putting you in a group. For the most part, most folks in here. There's some, maybe some exceptions in here. Medical community is a little bit different sometimes like that. Your first job might be a group. But for the most part, you need to go give your community 12 months back. You need to go do a functional job before we're talking about waving 12 months, right? You know a commander out there somewhere and they love you and you're gonna try to get them to by name request you and wave all this 12 months and everything like that. Um, I, I'm really not having it, I'm really not feeling it. We really need to keep some integrity there. You can be by name requested if you're local at an installation and it, we're not gonna have to pay to move you and some things like that, we'll consider it. But just know that, you know, really you should be in the seat about 12 months before we're talking about group positions for you. But know this though, when we do put you on a slate and you interview and you know, cause you've been talking to the commander, you're their number one, right? You might also be number one on three other slates that we put you on. They're all happening at the same time, right? There is a myriad of factors there. PCS restrictions, multiple number one selections, join spouse, you know, can a spouse be supported somewhere? So we have to deconflict all the number ones and all of that. So sometimes commanders, they don't get their number one. They get their number two or their number three. It's our goal to get them their number one or two, but sometimes that doesn't work out. You know, sometimes you're gonna just know I was number one on there, but we had to place the number two there because joint spouse could be selected. Now all of a sudden we're looking at you for something else. There is a myriad of different things that we have to navigate. That comes into the hand matching. That's where I tell you that I'm never gonna tell you with certainty if you're gonna get a job or not because there's a lot of things I can't predict that will go down. And uh, group, I put this up there because that's just a good example of it. Next slide, please. Okay, command chief process. Again, we're not gonna talk about this uh, too much, but a couple things that I want you to know. The way you get in the game for command chief uh, consideration is you are vectored. On your EPR, it's the only EPR vector that actually means anything and carries any weight right now with anything we do, it means you are ready now, command chief. That gets you to the screening board. Primary vector. Primary vector. 
primary vector, absolutely. Not secondary vector. Ready now, primary vector, command chief. That gets you to the screening board. All that means then is the board's gonna look at your records. This is a board that's, uh, uh, um, it is chaired by a lieutenant general. SimSAF sits on that board. Three MAGCOM or COCOM command chiefs sit on that board. And then uh, three general officers are also on that board and they really scrub and look at the records. When I started in the chief's group, day one on the job is when we did the command chief screening board. Um, I was absolutely impressed with our MAGCOM command chief, SimSAF and those GOs with how they just went through the records. They can talk about things in there because it's, it's, it's a non-sanctioned board, so it's a little bit different, but it's about experience. Look, I don't want to crush your dreams. If you want to be a command chief, you need to go out and you need to get experience as a chief. Being a chief in the United States Air Force, that is not sitting at one spot for three years thinking that then all of a sudden you're going to be ultra competitive for a command chief. Even if I could put you on that list, a wing commander still wouldn't hire you. Go out, do a job for, for two years, go on to the next job, get some experience. You know, if you've been sitting in an MFM position for three or four years and all of a sudden you're wondering why you're not getting put on the command chief candidates list, it's because you don't have the, ex the breadth of experience of your peers across the enterprise. So just understand that, that we're really looking at experience, a lot of other factors, how are you leading other chiefs and those kind of things. Um, but that's what the screening board's looking at. And then uh, if you come out on that list, then everything flows through your MAGCOM command chief. Again, you guys are well, well early in the seat to be thinking about that, but just understand that it starts with your EPR vector. If you're interested in going down that path, talk to your command chief. Sit down with your wing command chief. They'll explain to you the process and tell you, hey, here's some steps. They might help you get the next job to start building that resume so you'll be competitive one day. Next slide, please. Assignment stability is an initiative, not implemented yet. This gets after some of the stuff that I told you I've been finding and seeing over the last uh, four months that I think we need to change. So here's the thing, team. Some of you are going to find this to be a good thing. Some of you are going to hate me for it, um, and I'll take that. Right now, 12 months and you can move. So for some of you guys, that means I can move you at 12 months. And we're moving a lot of chiefs way too soon. We're burning our chiefs out. More important than that, the number one chief complaint that I get from commanders is about organizational stability. You take a, a, a location like Altus where maybe folks don't like to be there for too long. Chief gets there. They might do six months. They're already in another assignment cycle. They're putting in to go somewhere. They get an assignment. We might even deploy them in there. They're, they're really operating without a chief. We need more organizational stability. I have the team right now peeling it back to see what does it take for us to go to 24 month um, time, minimum time on station for you to volunteer for an assignment. There will still be, nothing is an absolute, there will still be times, career field managers, vectored positions and things like that where we're going to have to move chiefs before 24 months, but the standard, the goal is going to be we're trying not to move you more than 24 months, right? So we're, I'm trying to figure out what the words look like there, how do we implement that? But I will tell you we're going to go away from 12 months. I will tell you that right now, trying to get there to 24 months. Some folks love that because it gives them a little bit more time and stability where they're at. There's other folks that are somewhere like, no, I want to be able to leave every 12 months and go do something. It's just crushing our organizations. Something we got to get after. The 90-day report no later in day. It's the example I gave you earlier. Look, I owe you better than that. I owe you better than a 30-day report no later in day. The standard needs to be 90. If there's a mission-related reason why we need to move that up, then commanders can submit that. Hey, and if you volunteer to go early, you can go early. Right? You can work all of that and we'll work it, but I think the standard and the starting point needs to be 90, not 30 days. So that, those are some areas that we're going. We want to be able to kind of move things. I got to work with career field managers here. Priority plans. Career field managers control the priority plans. If you've got a problem with your priority plan, talk to your career field manager. Um, but right now, you got to be moving up the priority plan, and that drives a lot of how we look at your assignments. I want to be able to give you some flexibility, maybe tiering them out, maybe be able to move lateral from the tiers. Here's the deal. What's the difference between 22 and 25? Probably nothing, right, from a job responsibility standpoint. So maybe if it works for the family, we should be able to consider that. There's probably a significant dif difference between 22 and 2, right? You need experience for chiefs to kind of go and do that. So I'm working with career field managers to see how we can kind of change that. Smaller career fields, you got five chiefs, that's tough, right? That's tough to work. Larger career fields, we've got some flexibility. So where we can have that flexibility, I want to use it. And then notifications, this doesn't apply to you guys, with the exception of I guess it does. Know this, when you volunteer for an assignment, your wing commander and your senior raider get an automated generated email in Slickums. 
they get that every time you do something in Slickums. So if you're uncertain and every day you're going in there and you're reordering your vectors or stuff, whatever, think about what you're looking like to your wing commander and your command chief. They're getting an email every time you So think about it. We're not going to do anything before the end of the week. Think about it and then at the end of the week maybe say, okay, this is my thing and get it there. You know, I get it. Maybe once or twice through the week you might have a conversation. And here's something too. Talk to your wing command chiefs. The reason that they're CC'd on that is they should be involved in some of that. What you're thinking, where you're at. You're thinking about applying for a job to be a commandant. No, you've got no PME experience. He's like, what are you doing? You know, stop. Slow down. Talk to them. Tell them what you're interested in. That's what they're there for. Make them earn their paycheck. Next slide, please. Final thoughts. Okay, and then we're going to get into some Q&A. We've got about 15 minutes left. Get to know your assignment manager. Please do not use me as the easy button. I love you all. I really do. I really do. But I just don't have the bandwidth. I just do not have the bandwidth. Please start the conversation with your assignment managers. Active duty service commitment, your responsibility, you're signing up for it, you're taking the stripe. We'll leave it at that. Communicate often and early. Challenge versus hardship. So here we go. You're going to all come to me and say, I got this hardship. You will use the word hardship. It's a challenge. Hey, PCS in every 18 months, go look at my bio, right? It's, it's not unique to you. It's what's happening all the time. I'm trying to get after it systematically, right, so we're not doing it. That is not a hardship. That's a challenge. I get it. It's hard on your families. I want to change it. I want to fix it. But I can't just not PCS you this assignment cycle because we, you PCS 18 months ago. You know, it is what it is with that. Hardship. We have a chief at one of our locations. Wife's got Luke Eric, Luke Eric's disease. She's going to pass away. Chief is at 29 years. Chief's been at this location way too long. I don't care. The right thing to do is to leave that chief and that family right there where they're at. Everybody told me we need to move them, make them retire, do whatever. Not in my book. We're not going to do that. That's a hardship, right? You're going through a divorce, Right? Maybe you've got a spouse that's got an alcohol problem, so you're kind of single parenting it right now, but you're not single parenting it, you know, and you're trying to work through those things. We can give you a buy on an assignment cycle. Talk to your command chief and float it up like that, right? I shouldn't be your first call. I'm going to ask you if your command chief knows about it. I get it. Sometimes it can be embarrassing, but you need to have those conversations, and then we're going to get you, you know, some help and things like that. Once the assignment is loaded, the assignment is loaded, you're going. Don't come back to me the next cycle and say that, hey, all of a sudden my dream assignment's up there. Then when we can help, develop a plan. So I want to go back to what I was just telling you about, you know, hey, we can help you. We can accommodate. I'm going to accommodate you, and let's say that accommodation is got it. That's a significant problem. I'm going to give you 12 months. We're not going to touch you for an assignment. I don't care if you're the... The, the number one person to move, never been on a remote, you name it. Give me the scenario. To take care of you and your family, we're not going to touch you for an assignment for 12 months. What do you think is going to happen in 12 months? You're going to get an assignment, right? But before that, I'm going to get an email saying we need to do another exception to policy because we didn't plan about it. Sometimes the plan is a tough conversation. Maybe it's an active duty service commitment and it's time for you to retire early because we just can't, the, the Air Force isn't conducive for, for your family and what you're doing. Those are some of the tough conversations, some of the tough things we need to do. What I need you to do is have a plan. I need you to think, okay, Chiefs Group just said one cycle, four cycles, whatever it is. Know that when you come back to me at the end of that, I'm not going to give you another exception to policy for the same thing. It would be a very rare circumstance, let me put it that way. I won't want to say never because depending on what's going on, there, there could be a reason why we need to extend it. But a lot of times... Um, that's, that's probably been the hardest thing for me to handle is folks will take it personal and they'll make it personal and then all of a sudden I'm a really bad person. Um, want to call me some names and things like that and it's, it's just, it's not fun for, I don't care who you are when you're in that seat, but it's not personal. At that point, right, we need to have a plan and we need to move on. We can't continue to leave folks in, in assignments for forever. Next slide, please. Questions and comments. So we've got about um, 15 minutes left. Then you want to a couple things while some people think of some questions, I'm going to invite some support fires for love here. Volunteer for assignments and you're not qualified. So help the assignment managers out. If you see that there's a job in Australia that you really, really want to do, because it's in Australia, you've always wanted to go there, but it's not your AFSC, don't volunteer for it. <laughs> Seriously, I didn't know this until DC, this predecessor to the DC, so 
Ben, I'll, I'll add to that too. I'll, I'll add to that. That's where your wing command chief can help you. I can, I've said that a couple of times. You should be communicating with your wing. If you don't know, that's okay. You're new in this. If you don't know, go talk to your wing command chief and say, I saw this. What is it? Do you think I meet the qualifications to do that? They're going to guide you in the right direction. In the chief's handbook, I cannot say enough how important it is to have that thing on your desktop. You know, I've been a chief for a hot minute, not as long as blood. But you know what? I can't even as a NAV chief, I remember calling Chief Way the ACC command chief. He's like, hey Dave, this is the deal. He's like, did you look at the Chief's handbook yet? I'm like, I'll call you back. <laughs> <laughs> that was like a year ago, right? So I still have to be like, so I had it on my desktop. Now the first question I have, when any chief asks me something, the first question I ask is, have you looked at the Chief's handbook yet? First thing I do before I call Chief Blood is I look at the handbook. I know what the handbook says before I ever talk to him. If I call him and I say something, he's like, then it's in the handbook. Ben, what you doing? So, I know what the wing said, the yellow, until he said, oh, I have a product name. I knew, I knew that was going to happen. They, they warned me. They're, they're dialing, I think, the next speaker. <laughs> he said, read the handbook. Good advice. Good Absolutely. Good points. Good points. All right. Questions in the back. Hey, Chief. Uh, Senior Rodriguez for Office of Air Force Base. So uh, talking about Assad's and improvements, um, just want to ask this question. So say one gets approved, so then, you know, the chief is good for that period. They're locked in, I guess. And then during that Assad, there's a SIP job that the chief is qualified for on that same base, and it's maybe a three-year job, can the chief apply for that SIP job um, it, while it, they're doing their If assignment? it's on the same base, I would consider you for the job. Only if it's on the same base. Yes. Right? Only if it's on the same base. Here's the deal. Here's the rule. You get an aside, you're, I'm, I'm hold, you're holding me till I'm not moving you. I'm holding you till you're not moving. All of a sudden, 
dream SIP job opens up at another base, I'm not considering you for it. If it's at the same location, I will. JV? OK. I, see it, right? I, I don't know everything, but you see where I'm going, right? <laughs> He's here to say, Ludge, you're wrong. <laughs> He'd say Chief Ludge, you know, but all right, cool. All right, excellent. Chief Washington, Luke Air Force Base. Uh, along the same lines, uh, with the side, if you and the family have an agreement, you, you have a junior that's going to be a senior, you want to not lose the assignment, because I know Hassad keeps you in place, uh, and, and the family's okay, like, can, is, is there some way that you can take the chief, fill the group, uh, fill the spot for the career field, leave the family in place so that they're stable and the kid graduates? Uh, how do you navigate that situation? I, I have that so again, that's not well. the chief's group. So if you say, hey, I don't want to do an aside, and I'm going to take an assignment, I'm going to leave my family back here so they can figure out high school, there is just normal assignment rules through AFPC that will help you navigate that process. The chief's group wouldn't do that. Make sense? You are mute. Senior Leone from Lackland Air Force Base. Um, question on the tiers, on some of the assignments, they have tier one, tier two, tier three. Do you have to be vectored to apply for those, or is it just based on the career field and whether it's a cross flow? It depends on your it depends on your career field. I'm talking with career field managers. If I could get my wish for a day with CFMs, it would be that we standardize that process across all AFSC. So we're doing it as some career fields you have to be vectored. Some career field managers are good with communicating that. Others not so much. But for the most part, yes. If you're applying for a job and your career field vectors, you have got to be vectored for that tier in order for us to consider it. If your career field tiers positions, but they don't provide vectors, then you're all in as long as you're moving up the priority plan. Chief uh, Senior Carell from Joint Base Andrews. Uh, talking about the ever-changing AOR and 365 deployments, how much uh, is AFSENT involved in that process when it comes to assignment cycles? Uh, or in, even, even in the joint environment. Right, so AFSEN is absolutely involved. Right now we're canceling some uh, 9G assignments because we're redoing the way we're doing in that theater and that has, that has shook up. Sometimes I, I ask AFSEN to communicate with us a little bit more so we can get in front of it. The uh, last one I learned about the same time the chief learned it got canceled. We got to do a little bit better than that. Um, the other part of it, you said 365, where was he at? 365 and then joint. Was it? Yeah, the joint fire with not just absent, but is there other, other co-coms, things like that, are they involved in that process? Yes. So, so here, here's the way the process works for all of those assignment validations. So one entity I haven't talked about much is your MAGCOM A1. Your MAGCOM A1 or the owning MAGCOM A1 for all of those positions, whatever they are, they validate those vacancies, and that's how they get to Slickums to be advertised in the first part. The Chiefs group is simply I taking what you told me you need, and we're making sure that we put eligible Chiefs against those requirements in Slickums, but the Magcoms, the Magcoms uh, kind of own that process from getting them into Slickums. No, we don't hear them. Hey, Chief Senior Sleeves from Hickam. Question uh, real quick is, uh, if it's not already shared, can we share the CFM priority list uh, as we're going through and rack and stacking, as well as any forecasted unfunded that are soon to be, so we don't put ourselves in a spot and then have to then bounce out in regards to that stability piece that you're, you taught. So forecasted unfunded is a good question. Um, we update that as they come in. Um, that you know you can look out at the chief grade review for things that were done in two years ago. Um, all the all the command chiefs have that information, um, but your career fields, the timeline in which that happens varies by how that they operate in there. The priority plans are absolutely shareable. Your career field managers should be sharing them now. If your career field manager isn't sharing with you priority plans, you should ping them and say, hey, where's our priority plan? And guess what? They change them periodically too. So you might have one that's six months old. It may not be accurate. Um, and that may impact you for getting non-vault, right? If you think that you're in the number two priority plan on your career field, and then all of a sudden that shifts down to number 12, you just got a little bit more vulnerable to be non-vault for something versus the chief to sitting in the number two position. All right, cool. Five minutes. Hey, Chief. This is Chief Randy James from Langley. This is Chief Randy, uh, Chief Randy James from Langley. This may be related to the previous question. 
As far as the secondary vector, will that ever reflect in Slickums? Unless that's the priority plan that he was talking about. Secondary vector in reflect in Slickums 4. Yeah, so we have our primary vector that's uh, reflected in Slickums. Um, is, th is there a secondary vector or is that the CFM priority plan that he, that he was referring to? It, it, I don't think it's the priority plan if there's a secondary vector in Slickums. I have to go back and get with the Slickums team to find out you know, how that would look. I know we're modernizing the site right now. Um, not an expert in, the, in what it's actually showing, but let me go back and take a look at that and see, and we can get back with you guys on that answer. Can you answer that? Okay, go ahead, JV. Use your outside voice. We got two minutes. Yes, uh, so it has to reflect in slick. Your secondary vector has to reflect in slickums for you to, to bounce off of. Is that correct? Yeah, it makes sense. The best, the best way that I would explain it too is. If it's not in Slickums, it should be in Slickums because that's the only way we know it. Yeah, because yeah, we had secondary vectors vectors that were not reflected in Slickums, and that's how we based our rack and stacks. Thanks. Thank you. All right, one more question. All right, is it two or one more? T one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Chief uh, Sergeant Parrish from Joint Base San Antonio. The question I have is in regards to. Uh, again, vectoring, but specifically to the out of cycle. So I'm uh, curious to see if the out of cycle comes out and, uh, you know, there's an assignment available. However, the uh, members that are uh, wanting that assignment were not vectored. How, how does that go? If you're not vectored, you're not eligible, right? It, it, it's that simple. If you're not vectored because we're not going to put you on the slate for something you're ineligible for. So again, if you disagree with your vectors and things like that, and I'll tell you, I have an opinion, it, it's, this isn't the forum for it right now, on career field managers providing these vectors and doing some of that. It's a process we use right now. I don't know that they should be in there for all vectors, but if you're not vectored for a position, we're not gonna consider you for it. You're, you're, you're ineligible, you don't qualify from, from our standpoint. So hey team, I appreciate everybody, I appreciate the questions. Um, I'm here for the rest of the week through Thursday. We won't be here for the MagCom day. JV is here. He is set up in, in the back in the break room. Please see him. Uh, I'm paying him to be here to kind of help you with some of those questions. Um, but again, if you, if you need anything and you're unsure, let us know. Start with your assignment manager. We appreciate you guys. I do know that there's a lot of uncertainty when you're in the seats here, but uh, let us know where we can help. Thank you. And then most important, congratulations. None of you here on accident.